Honoring our World War II veterans. Part 4, Warfare. Aviation. All metal fighters replace fabric biplanes. During World War II, the United States manufactured nearly 300,000 aircrafts, including fighters, bombers, trainers, and transport aircrafts. P-51 Mustang. The P-51 Mustang is widely regarded as the finest all-around piston engine fighter of World War II to be produced in significant numbers. The 88mm anti-aircraft gun was Germany's main air defense. Weapons for World War II. Garling gun is a gun with barrels for shoot. It can shoot up to 3,000 bullets per minute. The U.S. 81mm Mortal M29 in World War II, the U.S. 81mm Mortal M29 was developed in World War II. It fired up to 3,800 yards. But if you brush the L.I. Rank was a chief quartermaster. Okay, do you know what a quartermaster is? Anyone? All right, good. A quartermaster in the Navy was an expert in navigation of ships. You a private tank that features the In the Navy, a quartermaster is an expert in the navigation of a ship. They are assistants to the officers of the deck and the navigator. Some of their duties included steering the ship, which my dad did. He also said he had to drive the ship in and out of port. Okay. Um, he, had, he also did signaling, and in those days they used a lot of flags, okay, so they were up on deck, and you couldn't, we didn't have communications like telephone much in those days, or emails or anything of that kind. They were, they were communicating with somebody way over there with the use of flags, and they, Dad also knew Morse code, you've heard of that probably. It was a code that they could communicate with via the telegraph lines, I think. Anyway, all right. He also had responsibilities for keeping track of the navigation instruments, and he prepared nautical charts. Uh, he did record keeping. Uh, he had to conduct weather observations and take compass readings and gyroscope readings to keep the ship afloat. Um, he computed the times of the sunsets and the sunrise and determined the ship's position by visual and electronic means. He had to use an azimuth that was called, I don't know, what it does, but he did. A minesweeper is a small naval warship that used various mechanisms to locate and disable mines that were placed in the waterways. Okay, They were expected to go before other ships would come behind them. It starts with the bugler blowing. Okay, the D-Day invasion was a turning point in World War II. Okay, that's an important thing. That D-Day invasion was when the war turned to, to our winning side, okay? Um, D-Day was a secret mission to try to stop Hitler's German army from continuing his pursuit of world domination. Okay, this is Dad's account from the book uh, about, about D-Day on June 6th. He said, we never had a clue that we were going to Normandy. They didn't even tell the minesweepers where they were going. It was that secret. Okay? Dad didn't even know. He was the quartermaster on the dock, giving information to the helmsman and the captain, and Dad didn't know. We never had a clue we were going to Normandy. We went on investigative missions at night, so we weren't able to be seen. D-Day, they said, was going to be June 6th. We had been monkeying around there for two or three weeks before making false starts and then turning around and going back just to shake the Germans up. So they'd been out sweeping and, and then they turn around and go back just to shake them up. The beach had two beachheads, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. You ever heard about those? And yep. Okay. Separated by three or four miles. Omaha Beach was on the French coast close to England. Utah Beach was on the peninsula. The invasion forces would go in with a big armada of ships covering a large area of ocean. We were out there every night sweeping the area and we were very busy. 
minesweeping at night. We left England on June 5th around dusk and we had a whole squadron of 11 sweepers and there were hundreds of ships in the invasion. But on June 7th, the day after D-Day, they weren't sweeping. They went into sh in toward shore, I think Dad had said in one of his accounts. Um, and all of a sudden, they were standing over, looking, oh, I know. They were looking on the rail of the ship, watching the men climbing up those cliffs on land to get um, up the cliffs onto the land. And they were getting bombarded with all sorts. They just lost so many men and they were they were dying everywhere. And these men were there watching this, this and thinking to themselves, why are we so lucky we're sitting here, you know, watching this and we're safe. When all of a sudden they heard a big explosion like a hammer that was mag magnified. Yeah, huge explosion. The U.S. Tide had hit two mines. USS Tide. That my, that my dad was on. Okay, and the boat uh, from from accounts of people that were near other ships that were near, they were watching that what happened to the USS Tide, and they said that the boat lifted five feet out of the water, the whole boat, when it hit the mine. Okay, Dad being um, Dad being on that upper deck. Dave, can you tell me or tell them where that would be on this picture? I think the I think it's up in here in this area. On the bridge. There was the bridge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right here in this area of the ship. You see? Mm -hmm. He was outside. And he was outside when it happened, thankfully. Because many who were inside under the under the ship were in even the captain who was inside the quarter deck pilot house, pilot house died because they went up, didn't have helmets on up and hit the ceiling and many died that way. Um, Dad was on the outer deck and because he was on the outer deck he went up in the air, flew up in the air and he figures he must have flew up in the air at least 40 feet because he was on one side of that quarter deck when he was when the explosion happened but when he woke up he was on the opposite side of the same deck. So he knows he had to have flown up and over. And he had to clear all this stuff. <sighs> Can you imagine? And he, he didn't remember the actual lying experience, but he woke up. Um, he figures it was 10 to 15 minutes later. Uh, he was on the opposite side of the deck and there was a big long box on that side of the ship that held flags that were going up, you know, that they'd raise up to here. Box of flags, and the flag box had a canvas cover all over it. So, Dad figures he must have landed on the canvas cover and bounced to the to the deck. They give you a private ship was near, and this ship was near. And how did they get a picture anyway like this? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Were you thinking that? This is an interesting story. A photographer. But news photographers had come. What about the army? <laughs> no, first news time. photographers had come. They were the first time they were allowed to come and take pictures. And news, there was a news crew on another boat right near them. They had taken pictures on D-Day, but this was the day after D-Day. And uh, they had taken pictures, and they were right there taking these pictures. And this was on June 7th. Think about that in the calendar, June 7th. Well, not until July, what was the date? Late in July. It, this, this very picture that they took appeared on the cover of the New York Times, the, a big newspaper in uh, New York City. Yeah. So it was used for the detection of objects under the water and for measuring the water's depth by emitting sound pulses or measured the return after being reflected. 
radar. A radar antenna transmits radio frequency energy focused into a beam, which is made to scan a wide area. Atomic bomb. The first atomic bomb happened on August 6, 1945. The second one happened a few days later on August 9, 1945. Thank you!